Well, good morning, 1115, and uh, I want to thank you guys for making it out in Snowpocalypse. It, uh, it's really good to be here with you guys, and uh, man, I'm excited to be continuing our series, Making Change. And uh, this series is all about making positive changes in our life in 2019. And I think despite having really good lives materially, um, I feel like a lot of us struggle to feel satisfaction. And I hope that we can bring that to you through this series. And last week we talked about less is more. We had a lot of positive feedback about that. We talked about materialism and possessions. And we did get some negative feedback from the kids whose moms were throwing away all their toys to purge the house. They were like, stop it. No, I still love that. I play with that, Mom. It's like, you haven't touched it forever, at least my kids. But uh, this week um, our talk is titled Stress is Bad. And uh, I had intended on talking about financial debt, uh, but I began to realize as I was writing this that there's a deeper issue that I think ties a lot of our stress together. And uh, today, the, the thing that I want to talk about, the root of most of the stress in our life is procrastination. And uh, I'll talk on that later. <laughs> okay, see what I did there? Um, but anyway, no, I want to talk about procrastination today, and uh, I'm excited about that. A brief definition for procrastination to me is um, choosing fun today instead of work, um, for work tomorrow instead of fun, at the cost of some efficiency and quality. And uh, our key passage today comes from Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 54, going all the way through verse 59. And a little background, at this point, Jesus is halfway through his ministry, and he is packing it out everywhere he goes. Luke 12, 1 tells us that there are so many people, they're literally trampling each other. Thousands, the Bible says. It's sort of like a music festival that you go to, and it's like hot and sweaty and terrible, and you're like, I hate being here, but I have to Instagram to all my friends, and I'm loving it here at Coachella. This is amazing, slash terrible. Um, but, I mean, that's how crowded it is. There's that many people. You know, imagine like Woodstock, but without the drugs and with God being present there. So, anyway, this is what it says. It says, then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, when you see the clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower, and you're right. And when the south wind blows, you say, today's going to be a scorcher, and it is. You fools. It's like, Jesus, you're really really know how to butter up a crowd. Um, you fools, you know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. And this is such a great passage. It's speaking about procrastination. And uh, Jesus is basically saying, hey, it's not no hard to know that you need to prepare for something. And when you see a storm coming, you got to get ready for it. And yet there's so many people who don't get ready for the storms of life, right? I mean, there are people who ignore the obvious signs of, 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 uh, of life. Like atheists ignore the obvious signs that something can't come from nothing. Colleges ignore the obvious and empirical signs that a current progressive curriculum is destroying society, producing lower quality, less happy, less equipped students at higher cost. Sometimes husbands ignore the obvious signs that their wife is upset and a storm is coming. Sometimes wives ignore the signs that they're depriving their husbands of fundamental needs because we're comfortable. Going inside to address a storm requires getting up and pulling in the patio furniture and setting down the drink after a relaxing afternoon. And some people just don't want to do it. And Jesus says, hey, you need to deal with this, okay? Procrastination matters. It costs you. Now, the best part of this passage comes at verse 57, 58, and 59. But to get to those, I kind of have to unpack the whole first part of this talk. We'll get to that at the very, very end. But uh, I want to start this message off with a word of prayer. So if you pray with me, Jesus, we invite you into this place. We dedicate this service to you. And uh, our hearts are open, our minds are, are alert, and uh, we just ask, Lord, that your strength would prevail in this room and that your power would be made known to us. And uh, Lord, I even ask that you would change eternities through this message. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Now, um, a lot of the examples from this talk today come from a famous blogger named Tim Urban, and I really enjoy him. He has the third most famous TED Talk of all time, and uh, he writes the blog, Wait But Why? And uh, I'm really, I would urge you to check it out. It's really good. But uh, I see procrastination in a lot of places. For me, procrastination really began to take hold in college, college, writing papers. And it, normally what would happen for me, and if you're like me, you might relate to this, you get a paper assigned at the start of the semester, and you think, I'm going to develop a reasonable schedule for working on this paper, right? Paper assigned, and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time each day working on this paper. The final day, there may be some revising and editing, but it's not going to be, you know, ridiculous. And that would make sense. Now, the first day, you're like, okay, i got to get to work on this paper. But then you remember, oh, yeah, didn't that um, new movie or that new series, Jack Ryan, come out on Amazon Originals? Maybe I'll just check that out real quick because I love that Jim from The Office. He's so cute and whatever. And you watch the first episode, and you're like, this is amazing. I'm going to watch the whole, ni or the whole series tonight, right? So you don't do any work. You just procrastinate. You watch the whole thing. And it's weird, by the way, to watch Jim kiss a woman that's not Pam. It's like, that's not your wife, Jim. But uh, anyway, um, 
Then the next night you're like, I'm going to get to work because I procrastinated already. And then you start reading on Wikipedia about Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan. And I know it happened 25 years ago, but I think reading the whole article will be a good exercise because I just remembered that that's still a thing, right? And the following night you're like, okay, I really got to get to work and whatever. But you're reading the news and you hear a lot about China, right? And you're like, I got to know about this China thing. So you decide, I'm going to just zoom in on Google Earth to the city of Beijing so I can gain, gain a better geographical understanding of the way that Beijing fits into the greater context of China. I just want to learn a little bit about it, right? And uh, that's kind of interesting. But then you start reading about this human Winnie the Pooh named Xi Jinping, right? And he, you're like, oh, he's cute. Oh, wait, he's a despot who's killing thousands of Christians and burning churches. Oh, my goodness, it's terrible, right? And after that, you're kind of depressed. You can't do any work, so you go to sleep. You wake up the next day, and you're like, okay, I really got to get to work. But before I do, I just have to make a quick playlist on Spotify. <laughs> because, you know, I got to have a study playlist. I can't study without tunes. So you spend the next three hours developing this epic study playlist, and uh, it ends up taking all your time to study. So after a full week of procrastination, you're like, I just need a break from all this work of not studying. So you call your girlfriend. You say, I'm taking you out on the town of Chicago. And you waste $200 on parking and a mediocre dinner with bad service. And you get home, and you're mad, and you're frustrated, and you're depressed. And so the next morning, you say, I'm really going to get to work. But you call your mom, and you say, Mom, I'm just, I'm trying so hard at college, but, but high school didn't adequately prepare me, you know? And it's just not my fault, and blah, 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 and reasons, and you never taught me self-discipline, whatever. And your mom's like, I'm so sorry. You're right. It is all my fault. Oh, my goodness. I'll send you $200 more. Oh, life is so hard. Oh, my goodness. You need all work and no play. Make John a dull boy. So I'm like, okay, she's right. I'm going to join an intramural Frisbee team. So you spend the rest of your semester, like, tossing disc, trying trying to not think about the paper that you're so stressed about not writing. And finally, the final countdown is here. The last two days are here, and you have a 90-page paper that's due really quickly. You're like, what am I going to do? I, I skipped class for the last month for my intramural playoff games. I don't even know what this paper's about. What am I going to do, right? You have to revise your work schedule, and now suddenly it looks something like this, right? I mean, this is what it's become. It's like, oh, no, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is really not going to work good. So you spend the, new, the next two days eating ramen noodles in your dorm room, literally copying and pasting phrases and sentences from Wikipedia into your paper and then just rephrasing it so that you can, you know, avoid getting plagiarizing, you know, caught or whatever. And uh, you skip the next two nights of sleep and you, you know, drink Red Bull and Monster and you write a terrible low-quality paper that won't enrich your life or the world in any way. Then Chariots of Fire style, most of you don't know what that is, but whatever, Eric Little, you run across campus and you turn it in at the last possible minute. And a few days later, if you're like me, you get a phone call from your professor and he says, we need to talk about your paper because it's the best one we've ever seen. Because I'm just one of those people that can put it off to the last minute and produce greatness. Just kidding, those people don't exist. They say they do, but they don't. It's garbage if you procrastinate. Because when you procrastinate, you're choosing fun today instead of work for fun tomorrow, or for work tomorrow instead of fun at the cost of efficiency and quality, always. Procrastination happens for a lot of us in college because for the first time in life, we have some freedom and some lack of structure. I mean, high school in America is, it's easy. You know what I mean? Like, they literally hold your hand. High school today, they actually, like, help you focus. Like, they will discipline you if you pull out your cell phone. Like, put that down. You know, don't pull it out. It's like, <laughs> I mean, God forbid your kids develop some self-discipline uh, uh, self and self-motivation. That, that would be terrible for millennial children in America today. Um, but uh, I actually think that it gets worse after college. Okay? In college, there is still some small semblance of structure. But after college, there's none. There is no structure, Right? And the only consequences in life after college really are death, jail, homelessness, and starvation. That's like the full extent of what can happen. And I'll tell you what, the last two of those, homelessness and starvation, you almost have to work hard to do it. I mean, you have so many relatives and moms who will give you more chances and whatever. And, uh, you know, I mean, starvation in America because of food stamps, you actually have to work to, you know, starve yourself. There's a lot, there's a lot of opportunities for free food. Now, to use some of Tim Urban's thoughts here, I actually, in preparing this message, went to an MRI clinic. And I had two people have their brain scanned in an MRI. And I had the brain of a known non-procrastinator scanned and then the brain of a known procrastinator scanned. And I know almost none of you are trained to read MRIs, but the differences are so stark. I mean, you can actually see this in the scans. When you look at the brains, it's like stunning. 
And I know this is an extraordinarily smart room. All of you could have been neurosurgeons. So I'm sure that when I show you these MRI scans, you'll be able to, if you look closely, kind of see the differences. Now, let me show you the first actual brain. This is the brain of the non-procrastinator. And here is one segment, one cross-section of the brain, the actual brain right here. Okay? This here, this cross-section shows the rational decision maker firmly at the wheel, at the helm, if you would, of the brain, making good decisions. Now, I'm going to switch over to a cross-section of, of, of a brain that is the brain of a known procrastinator, and you'll see a slight difference right here. See that guy right here? That's the instant gratification monkey, okay? And uh, here's what happens, is your rational decision maker says, this looks like a perfect time to get some work done, and your instant gratification monkey says, nope, not today, okay? And uh, so then what happens is he drags you on a spiral of, you know, usually for me, Facebook Marketplace, looking at inboard direct drive ski boats, you know, from the 80s, even though I have one, and I just, you know, it's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And then he just jumps on that wheel, and he just takes control, and you go on a YouTube vortex spiral that starts with an amateur analysis of the agrarian, agrarian economy of dark age Europe, and it ends with a destructive rant by Ben Shapiro about Ariana Grande's mom. And it's like, how did we get here? What is happening? Right? And I'll tell you what's happening. Your instant gratification monkey has taken full control and authority of your life. And we all know people, in fact, many of us have been in this situation. This is exactly what addiction looks like. Consequently, this is exactly what the brain of millennials looks like as well. It's just instant gratification all the time. All of us must actually wrestle control of our minds back from the instant gratification monkey. Like, this is hard. This is something that we have to do in order to get out of procrastination. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, I want to talk about four places where I see procrastination plaguing our life, okay? The first... And the most obvious place is with our finances. I think all of us understand that, that financial debt is classic procrastination, right? You're saying, I'm going to have fun today, and I'll pay for it tomorrow, right? That's procrastination at the cost of some quality and efficiency, which would be interest, right? When you buy a car with a loan, have fun today, I'll pay for it tomorrow. Student debt, I'll have fun today, I'll pay for it tomorrow, right? Sometimes there's an investment there, but ultimately there's going to be a loss of some efficiency in the process. I had an acquaintance who purchased a new truck a few years ago. He put $1,000 down. He had bad credit. And uh, he paid out the door with taxes. Uh, he financed $64,000 for a brand new pickup truck. And uh, with his bad credit, he financed it at 8% for 84 months. This is when credit was lower. I've, I've actually heard from people that, um, that interest rates are, are now even higher than that. But uh, he ended up paying $18,482 extra above and beyond the price of the car in interest. So he paid $82,000 for a mediocre pickup truck that seven years later... By the time he paid for it, it was barely worth $10,000. Now, you do the math in, in, in your head. Is $82,000 for something worth $10,000? Is that a good investment or bad? Pretty sure it's bad, right? It's classic procrastination. It's fun now, and I'll pay for it later at the cost of some efficiency, right? And we do this in so many ways, right? Saving for retirement, classic procrastination, right? We'll go on trips. We'll remodel the house. We'll do a 30-year mortgage instead of a 15-year or a 10-year. We eat out all the time. We won't even begin saving until we're 55, and the problem with that is it costs you some efficiency in the form of compound interest. Compound interest can work for you. It can work against you. But let me just explain it to you really simply. It's, it's, it's interest that compounds upon itself. So if you save $2,000 a year for just eight short years, we're talking $16,000 total dollars, but at $2,000 a year for eight years, starting at 19 years of age, at 12% interest, which is a lot, but for the sake of this analogy, whatever, 12% interest, um, and then you never save again, ever, You'll have $2.23 million by the time you retire, right? Wow, it's a good investment, okay? If you start saving when the other person stopped, okay, they, they stopped at 26, so you start saving at 27 years of age, and you save for the rest of your life till you're 65, um, yeah, so that's 38 years, you'll end up with $1.53 million because of the power of compound interest, right? The earlier you start, the better. And this is what happens with finances, is, is we take a loan out on our future for fun today at the cost of efficiency, right? It's a big deal. It's, it's classic, classic procrastination. Now, um, this is classic procrastination, but we also do this with relationships, marriages, whatever, right? Rather than pursuing each other, rather than laying down our lives for each other, we have fun with our own hobbies, with our own friends. We're going to go out on our own time, right? I'll apologize tomorrow, but I'll pick them apart today. <laughs> Right? I'll, uh, I'll have fun uh, at her expense today. I'll make jokes at her expense. I'll pursue her tomorrow, right? I'll get her with a gift next year. I'll take her out for an her anniversary next year, right? It's relational procrastination. Or when dating, this is a big one too. We procrastinate. We say, I'm going to have fun today at the cost of tomorrow. You know, um, God always says, you know, don't have sex until you're married. And that's always like frustrating. But there's a reason for that. People who have sex before they're married are far more likely to get divorced, right? 
And uh, that's because sex is a binder. It binds a relationship together. So when you're dating, you know, um, the reason why God says don't have sex is because it allows you to evaluate with a clear mind that person's character and your compatibility together. I know so many people, you know, they have sex before they're married, and, you know, they're in a really clearly dysfunctional relationship, but they spend four years fighting and restraining orders and yelling and screaming and Facebook rants and everything else, and everybody's like, why are you together? I'll tell you why you're together, because you're using a beautiful tool that God created to make marriages better and to sustain the power of that covenant relationship, and you're using it outside of the context that God designed it to be used, right? It's fun today at the cost of my future. And I know so many relationships, so many marriages that would have never progressed into marriage had your mind been opened by doing it God's way, right? I mean, that's just what he teaches. It's relational procrastination. It's fun today at the cost of tomorrow. Just like financial debt, relational debt, it adds up and it compounds, right? And I see this in so many places in life. I used to think that God's wisdom was designed to have me miss out on fun, but now I'm like, oh no, it actually makes sense. Another place we procrastinate is our personal health, right? Working out, whatever, and I don't need to bore you with statistics of the obesity epidemic in America, but I will just tell you this. Letting your health go away, is, it's, it's classic procrastination, isn't it? It's, it's fun today. It's laziness today. It's relaxation today. It's more food today at the cost of my tomorrow, right? It's a knee replacement tomorrow. It's obesity tomorrow. It's, it's, it's diabetes tomorrow. It's back surgery tomorrow. It's a heart stint tomorrow. It's cardiovascular issues tomorrow, right? It's, it's fun today at the cost of tomorrow with a lower quality level, right? That's it procrastination. The fourth and, and final place I'm going to talk about right now is um, personal growth, personal growth. And uh, this one's a little bit more insidious. This is one that a lot of us miss. And <clears throat> here's the problem is um, all of us in life are leveling up on some, to some degree, right? You remember in kindergarten, you went into kindergarten and everybody, like the dumbest kid in the class was, was almost just as smart as the smartest kid in the class. Like top to bottom, there just wasn't that much variation, right? Everybody was pretty close to average. Um, but by the time you got to late high school, the disciplined kids, the kids who did all their work and always, you know, whatever, they, they had leveled up quite a bit. So there began to be a bigger difference because everybody's always leveling up. Now, um, I know a lot of people who act like they're 21-year-olds um, when they're 21, and that's fine. There's no problem with acting like you're 21 when you're 21. But, but when you're still living the 21-year-old dream when you're 23, 24, 25, 27 years old, it's like, <laughs> come on, you know? Like, you're living for Friday night TGIF, and you're living in your mom's basement. Like, there's a problem, right? You're still in Star Wars pajamas. Like, this is crazy here. Like, we got we to gotta do something about this. Now, I know several people. This, this happens, okay? True story. Um, you, uh, you, you're living a 21-year-old dream. You're a little bit older, and all of a sudden you realize all my friends in my cohort have moved on. They all have, like, you know, relationships and jobs and careers and degrees, and uh, I haven't done any of that. So you have to get new friends who are younger than you who are back in your cohort again, right? Because everybody else is leveling up, and what you're doing is you're living the same year on repeat over and over and over again. And it doesn't just happen at 21. People do this at different parts of our life, too. And what happens is you're missing out on the leveling up that should happen personally, with your humility, with your ability to admit that you're wrong, with your ability to give and receive criticism effectively, right? I know people, you're 30 years old, and if you receive criticism, you just, of any kind, even good, well, truthful, truthfully given criticism, you just crumble. Oh, I'm going to ghost you for two months. I'm not going to talk to you again because you criticized me. It's so hard, right? Personal discipline, relational and emotional intelligence, they're all still where they were when you stop trying to level up because you're still living the same year on repeat. It's procrastination. It's procrastination. It's fun today without the work, at the cost of tomorrow, for much more work, with the loss of some efficiency and quality, right? That's our life. That's procrastination. And we do it in all of these areas. There's actually a fifth area that I want to talk to you about, but I'm not going to get to it till the end of this talk. Now, these are the areas we procrastinate. I want to show you the cost of procrastination for just a moment, if you will, with me, because the cost of procrastination is pretty high. And I think a lot of times we don't actually quantify it, okay? The, the first thing about procrastination is your life is actually worse. Not just in the moment. This is incorrect. It's worse, like, truly, as a whole, it's worse. And um, Tim Urban calls procrastination, the fun of procrastination, he calls it the dark playground. And I actually think this is a really good description. Imagine sneaking into Indiana Beach. It's an amusement park in the area, right? And it's, it's less an amusement park and more a boulevard of broken dreams but, and rust. But um, anyway, um, imagine sneaking into that place at night after it's closed, right? Nobody's there. There's nobody running the rides. And you're not supposed to be there, but it's like kind of fun because you're in this place and like you go to a roller coaster and you start pulling levers and pushing buttons and you know, you get the chain going and all of a sudden the cards start going. You like run next to it and you jump in and you're like, this is so unsafe. <laughs> it's just my life, you know? I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I could die, you know? And you're on the ride and you're like, am I going to get arrested? 
it? Am I going to go to jail? I mean, for me in this place, that's a really bad idea. There's, there's probably going to be some force that's used. You know, I don't want, I just don't want it to happen. It's going to be a bad deal, right? And I'm just stressed because, because I want to enjoy it, and it's kind of fun, but it's worse than it could be if I was doing it in the right context. The dark playground is many things. It's Netflix when you should be working on a paper. It's sex when you're not married. It's a vacation that you can't afford because you have no savings. It's, it's a car or boat that you financed, and, and you love it, and it's fun, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not what it could be. There's stress in the back of your mind because you know you're not ready for it yet. The dark playground, it's not boring. I'm not saying it's always wrong. It's just it's in the shadows of what life could be. And I know people, you've lived your whole life, your whole life on the dark playground. You've never even experienced the light playground. I'm describing it, and you're like, that would be amazing. You know what I mean? To be like uh, prepared for something, you know, to pay for it ahead of time. That would be great. Then there's the light playground. And it comes after the work is complete. Your judgment on the light playground is much better, much better, because you can see everything in the light, right? You save for the truck, you're ready to buy it, and your judgment's a little bit better because you know how long it took to earn that. Maybe you're like, well, you know, Denali, LTZ, maybe I'll just do LT, right? It's good. We don't need to do the whole nine yards. I mean, we're good. You can see it. You can make better choices. Once you have the cash to pay for the truck, once you're there, you realize, man, it's guilt-free. It's reservation-free. It's uninhibited fun. And I'm not saying it's bad to have nice things. I'm just telling you that when you're on the light playground, there's going to be less worry, less stress. Stress is bad after all. The light playground is playing ultimate after the paper is written and after the work is done. It's a satisfaction of knowing that you are your spouse's only one and you're the best she's ever had, Right? It's the freedom of a vacation that you could afford and enjoy without worrying about spending $15 on a latte because you can afford it. And it's watching the game after the yard is mowed and the dishes are washed and the laundry is put away. Procrastination will cost you the joy of ever experiencing the light playground. I just want to challenge you to think about your life and really consider maybe it's time I make a change because I'm lighting my hair on fire and working so hard to keep all these plates spinning. And if I would just delay all these things that I want for a few years, I could have all that I want and more for much less. Now, um, the second cost of procrastination is that you'll have less life. And uh, this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize. This is one of those pernicious and insidious side effects of of procrastination that a lot of times you, you don't get. But because you're working less efficiently, and you're getting paid less, and you're paying way more in interest on every level, you'll actually have less life, uh, like less free life doing what you want to do. You'll be spending more time doing what you don't want to do. And the things that you want to do, you'll be doing them shorter because you're procrastinating. Jesus looks at the crowd and he's like, guys, can't you see the storm on the horizon? Like, this is dumb. This is not a way to live life. I mean, procrastination is a terrible idea. You're robbing yourself of what I want to give to you. The danger is coming. Can you not see the danger of it? Why, Why are you not preparing for it? The cost of procrastination is high. Life is worse and you'll have less of it. Now, I know a lot of you are like, well, that sounds terrible. That's just a big Debbie Downer, Pastor. Can you, like, do something about this? Yes, yes, yes. I'll give you, I'll give you some points here. Sorry if your name is Debbie. It's just an old SNL reference. Um, but anyway, um, I have two thoughts on how to address procrastination. Now, my first, my first thought is um, it's kind of hard to do. You're going you're gonna to see it, and you're going to be like, wah, wah, I can't do that. But my second thought is like a turbocharger for the first thought, right? It's what empowers. It's, what, it's the, the boost to the EcoBoost engine, right? It's like, it's like the big deal here. I'm going to show you how to empower the second part. My first thought is simple. It's, it's deadlines, it's boundaries, and it's consequences in your life. And I have had to do this in my life in a lot of different levels. But um, let me give you an example from my life. For me, uh, I, um, I have difficulty like controlling myself when it comes to using my phone to look at things specifically on Facebook Marketplace. Like I just love, I mean, I, the thought of missing out on knowing about a deal that I'll never buy, I don't know. I just, I can't, I can't, I'm always, and I'm just scrolling and trolling on there. I don't know why. I just do it. I look at, I look at boats mainly, right? And um, I have a pro. I, I love my job. I'm not complaining about my job, but um, a lot of times, I mean, I just, I work a lot, right? So I'll, I'll leave before my kids wake up. I'll come home after they're in bed and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not whining. I love what I get to do. It's just, I work a lot, right? So the other day, I made plans to come home early and the rest of the staff was here working on something, but I just, I needed to do it for my family. I came home early. I was so excited to be at home with my kids. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, I don't know how it happened, but somebody, me, put my phone in my hand and I'm scrolling on Facebook. 
And we have a rule in my house, okay? It's a boundary, if you will. You can't be on your phone from the moment you get home till the moment the kids are in bed, right? That's the rule. You can't do it, okay? Unless it's like, you know, a work phone call. But really, I mean, you can't be on your phone, especially for this reason. Like, you can't do it. And I'm like, what are, what are you? And Christian's like, what are you doing? We have a boundary for that. And so we agreed, next time this happens, next time you one more interaction, and, and the consequence is going to be you're deleting all social media from your phone, right? Well, um, a few days later, I'm sitting there, and I'm scrolling and trolling Facebook Marketplace, and there was this ad or something for, for swim apparel for men and women, and I saw a woman in swim apparel, and I was like, hello, and all of a sudden, I'm like, what are you doing? You just violated your wife's and your covenant together. You're looking at a woman that you're not even married, and I was like, oh my goodness, so I went to Kristen, and I said, hey, this happened. I've sinned against you on multiple different levels, and she, she's like, that's it, and I'm like, that's it, so we deleted it for my phone, right? Because I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to compromise on this level anymore. Now, I still have it on my computer, the Facebook or whatever. And the Facebook, how old am I? 55? <laughs> I have that Facebooks on my computer in the Instagram, okay? Um, listen, that would be nice, Instagram. I'd love that. Just, I look good. But anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, I got rid of those. There's somebody that will post for me occasionally, but I'm not on it is the bottom line. And I just ask you, is there a place in your life where you need to set a boundary or a consequence? Maybe a budget for your life. Right? A budget is a financial boundary that you put in place in your life. I mean, if your finances are always out of control, what if you tried that? You said, I'm going to set a boundary. Or I'm maybe making a time limit for Netflix or TV each month. And if you violate that boundary, that time limit, then you put a consequence in. I'm deleting my Netflix account. I'm cutting and canceling my cable. Right? I'm sometimes quitting something that's not important so that you can do what's most important is what you need to do in your life. For me, every single summer, there comes a point where I'll say, for a couple weeks or for a week, even though it's my passion, even though summer is short, I'm not going to water ski, right? And that's a tough decision to make. Like, that's a choice that I have to make, and I hate it, but sometimes I'll do it because there's more important. I had a, a friend of mine, you know, their, their marriage was in trouble, and they had no time for each other, and uh, we were just talking, and, and she happened to spend a good deal of time um, investing in her face in the morning with makeup and whatever, and uh, she said, no time, no time for my husband. I just can't. I can't even. There's not enough time, and we just said, hey, what if you made some time by putting aside, putting on your face and spending that time, dedicating that time, that 45 minutes or whatever you do um, to your husband. And she said, you know what? That's worth it. And that's the decision that she made, right? Um, and I'm not saying forever. And I'm not saying that makeup's bad or anything. I'm just saying in the context of their relationship, that's what was more important. Now, if you're like me, a lot of you see deadlines, boundaries, and consequences, and you're like, there's no way I can do that. You know, that's the problem. And, and I totally get it. A few years ago, I found a tool from Tim Urban that um, really changed the way that I looked at procrastination. I call it visualizing the cost. And uh, this really changed the way I looked at life. See, each of us has about 1,000 waking minutes. From the moment you get up to the moment you get go to bed, there's about 1,000 minutes. And if you divide those 1,000 minutes into 10-minute blocks of time, and that's kind of how I do my schedule now, 10-minute blocks of time, because um, you can be productive in 10 minutes, um, you have 100 blocks of time in the day. I just want you to visualize with me how we spend our time in the day because this really opens my eyes to the way I spend my time, like bathroom, showering, getting ready for bed, getting ready to wake up, the whole nine yards. Like across the, the course of the day, um, the hygiene stuff, that's about um, six uh, blocks of time, 60 minutes, right? And then you throw in their eating, right? It's an hour and a half by the time you throw in prepping food, washing dishes, you know, grocery shopping, cleaning up, actually consuming the food. I think that's a pretty reasonable amount of time. Then work, if you work a nine-hour work day, you know, with a lunch break in there or whatever, it's about um, 54 um, blocks of time. And then you throw in there a commute. If you have a 30-minute commute each way, that's, uh, you know, six blocks. And then, you know, your spouse, family, friends. It's kind of sad when you actually look at how much time you spend with your family, actually interacting with your kids, interacting with your spouse. Kind of lower than you think it is, okay? Um, then this is crazy. Th this, What? Okay, iPhone um, actually released an update, iOS released an update that, that allows you to see how much screen on time you have. And the average iPhone user spends 120 minutes of screen on time per day, which is just mind-blowing to me, mind-numbing. But anyway, um, after that comes, you know, 20 minutes of Bible reading and prayer, maybe 30 minutes of household chores, and maybe if you're lucky, 40 minutes of TV, four blocks of time at the end. I look at that, and it's like amazing to me how quickly a full day can go. I mean, this is a really full day right here, and it just, it goes. It goes quickly, right? Now, this next chart is the one that really kind of blew my mind, because I looked at that, and I was like, okay, okay. Um, this right here is 4,160 weeks. That's how many weeks are in your entire life. Each column is one year. There's 52 blocks high, and each column, there's 80 going this way. So um, that's, that's, 80, that's an 80-year life. And I look at each of those blocks, and I look at that whole graph, which is a picture of a human life, and I think, that, that's not that many blocks. 
Like that's not that much time at all. And then I just thought, well, maybe it'll be fun to, to show myself how much time I have left by putting my 33 and three-quarter years on there. And I was like, ooh, that's like definitely more than a quarter, definitely more than a third. It's almost like halfway, you know? And for me, that's kind of astonishing to think that that's how much of my life is gone. Like, I've already lived that much. Then I started doing something. I started looking at the average iPhone user. Okay, two hours a day, that's, um, that's 43 days per year, dawn to dusk, that an average iPhone user spends on their phone. That's 6.1 weeks per year, and that comes out to 9.38 years of an entire lifetime, almost a full decade scrolling and trolling. And that's if you are an average phone user. That's a sixth of your adult life. Now, what blew my mind is, I have between 150 and 180 elective minutes a day. It's like an average amount of of minutes that you can spend doing whatever you want, from watching TV to working on the garage to tinkering with hobbies to, you know, talking with your kids. And a lot of us spend 120 of those 150 to 180 minutes, almost all of our elective time, we spend on our phones. Oh, I want to die. So um, here's the thing. When you visualize your life like this, it's a little eye-opening, isn't it? It's funny, all the services, people are like, oh, this is great, I love this talk. Oh, like everybody's sick, like gagging at this point. But it makes boundaries and consequences much easier to set in your life as you visualize the cost, doesn't it? Because you begin to realize, man, like my time is, is precious. I look at these boxes and I see I'm, I'm, I'm almost halfway done with my life. Like I want to start to maximize every moment a lot better. Like I want to change what I do. I just want to challenge you to start to take action. Let me tell you, it starts one day at a time. I think one of the big problems is for so many of us, we look at this and we're like, I'm going to live the rest of my life better. And the problem is that's like a big, that's a big goal. It's hard for me to like say, I'm going to live every day better. Um, but what I've done is I've just, I've got this up in my house. I actually have my dashboard. Um, but don't cover up your speedometer unless you're one of those people who doesn't need that. Like I'm above speed. Okay. And maybe put on your tachometer because who cares? I drive like Mario Andretti. But um, for me, it's just one day at a time. When I see this, I just say, okay, Lord, I'm giving you all 100 blocks. I just, I want you to have it. I I put it in your hands. I want to maximize this. I want to live this for you. So I'm giving it all to you, every single block of time that I have, right? Underneath there, it says, I have blank weeks left. And I just challenge you to figure out how many weeks you have left in your life based on an 80-year life, right? It's just, um, it's just, I forget how to do that. Oh, yeah, it's uh, your age, 80 minus your age times 52, right? That's how many weeks you have left. But um, I want you to write it in there and just start thinking, this is what I've got. And if you're over 80 years old, congratulations, you're on borrowed time. You made it. You know, you're, you've lived longer than most people get to live. I just want us to start thinking, wow, like every single week really matters. Every single day is really important. And as I visualize my life, as I look at this graph right here, all of a sudden I start to realize I, I really want to make the most of the days that God has given me. Like I want to start living more efficiently and more effectively. Now, um, there's one more area in which I think many of us procrastinate. I think it's actually the most important area of procrastination, and that has to do with eternity. I think most of us struggle in this particular area, and this is what Jesus is primarily focusing on in our key passage today. It says in verse 54, then Jesus turned to the crowd and he said, when you see the clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower, and you're right. And when the south wind blows, you say, today will be a scorcher, and it is. You fools, You know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. Jesus is saying, can't you see that God is real? I mean, you get ready for all these different areas of your life, but the most important area, you don't even think about it. Like, what is wrong with that? Of course God is real. Of course God exists. I mean, he says, look at the signs outside of the Bible. Where does a storm come from? Something doesn't come from nothing. Where does the universe come from? Intelligent design doesn't come from no intelligence. Look, protein structures are far too complex to come on their own, right? Double helix DNA and ribosomes are what make them, but you can't have DNA without protein. You can't have protein without DNA. You look at a single-celled organism, and it is more complex than anything humanity has ever been able to manufacture by a long shot, right? Even... What's more interesting today is is we look at the physics of the universe, and we begin to get into the very minute details. We begin to see more and more. We always thought that the greatest miracle of the universe was life itself, but now we begin to realize, no, the greatest miracle of the universe is the universe. 
The fine tuning, the unique fine tuning of all the forces within the universe make it overwhelmingly apparent that there is a designer beyond it. And it's interesting to see all the theoretical, ph theoretical physicists of the age begin to become agnostics or even Christians as they realize, man, that's, that God is behind it. And I get that irresponsible or maybe superstitious people love to embrace the idea that there is no God. I understand that that is a desire that you have on your heart because it's great to live life without an authority. But, but that's silly. That's procrastination. That's superstition, right? God is real. There is a God beyond all of this. And not choosing to deal with that, that is classic procrastination. But not only is there evidence outside of the Bible, there's evidence inside the Bible. I talk about Old Testament prophecies all the time, but let's just zoom in for a moment and, and talk about um, Revelation for a moment. There's a lot of prophecy specifically about what the end of days will look like. And people used to say, well, Christianity isn't true because the nation of Israel doesn't exist. And Revelation talks exclusively about the nation of Israel as the epicenter of the end times, right? In the 1930s, this was a big deal. Atheists said, well, you know, the Bible is erroneous because of this. You know, I mean, since AD 76 and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, um, you know, Israel's not a nation. Then in 1948, something unprecedented in human history happened. A disparate people spread throughout the world without fighting for it, received their ancestral homeland back, and formed a new nation of Israel. Well, that didn't silence the skeptics because they said, well, it's really, it's really not Israel that's the epicenter of New Testament prophecy. It's, it's, it's the Middle East. And in the 60s and 70s, biblical skeptics said the Middle East is a, is a garbage dump in the middle of the world. I mean, nobody cares about it, right? The United States and Russia are not talked about in the Bible. Therefore, the Bible is false. It was proof the Bible was false. Then the oil embargoes happened. You guys remember that? The fuel shortages, the lines, all that, you know, all the big cars going out of business, everything. And then... 9-11 happened, and all of a sudden, the Middle East was elevated to the center of geopolitical strategy and politics and everything. And then, after 9-11, in the early 2000s, you know, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins began writing books about God is dead, and they pointed out a plethora of problems within the Christian narrative. But one of the ones they zoomed in on, this one I just really like, is they said, well, you know, the Bible talks about all these, these, these amazing world-leading cities that, that supposedly are going to, you know, rival New York and London and Paris, and there's no way a city in the Middle East, that little backward, culturally strange land, could ever <laughs> rival the greatest cities man's ever built until Dubai and Qatar came along, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, those are the greatest cities in the world now, huh? That's difficult, right? And Jesus is like, can't you see? I mean, can't you see that this is real? Can't you see that my word never returns void? Can't you see that my promises are always fulfilled? Jesus says, look at the storm. God's authority, his promises, his sovereignty is something that all of us will face. I feel like it's like going to a restaurant and saying, well, I don't believe we're ever going to get food here. You know, I don't believe in food at, at a restaurant. And you show up and the server takes your order and it's a sign that the food's coming, but it's like, mm, I, don't, I don't really believe in food from this restaurant. You know, and then he brings your, your drinks to the table. He says, your food will be here shortly. And you say, I don't believe, I don't believe they're going to bring me the food. I don't believe in food. It's not a, I don't have, I don't have faith in food, right? And then he comes out and he sets a napkin on your lap and says, your food will be here shortly. And you say, well, I don't, I don't believe that you're going to bring out the food. I don't believe it. I don't believe in food. I don't believe you're going to bring it, right? And then he lights the candles in front of you and, and it means the food's coming even sooner. He says, food's coming. He says, well, I don't believe in food, right? And then the music starts playing, and you know the food's coming even sooner. But I don't, I don't believe in food. I don't, I don't believe it's coming. I don't believe you're going to bring the food, right? And then he brings out the, the tray holder that will hold the tray that will set your food on, and you say, I don't believe it. Jesus says, you fool. What are you doing? Don't you understand? Don't you see that God is real? Don't you see his power around us? You can interpret the signs of the weather, but you can't interpret the power of God in our lives. What is wrong with you? I feel like so many of us, we procrastinate thinking about eternity. Right? And then he gets to the last part of this passage, and this is good. He says, why can't you decide for yourselves what is right? When you are on the way to court with your accuser, you, you try to settle the matter before you get there. That would make sense. Otherwise, your accuser will drag you before the judge, who will hand you over to an officer who will throw you into prison. And if that happens, you won't be free again until you have paid the very last penny. What he's talking about here is something called debtor's court. And imagine, if you will, in Hellenistic times, the biggest deterrent that they had to people not paying back debt is if you owed somebody money, they could take you to debtor's court. And if you owed somebody money, you would almost certainly be thrown into prison, okay? And uh, in debtor's prison, you would get paid pennies on the dollar. So even if you owed somebody even a modest debt, you would be there for the rest of your life. And it was a big deterrent for people not paying back debt. But he says, Jesus says, if you're going to court with somebody to whom you owe money, you're obviously going to try and negotiate a deal. It's better for them. It's better for you. Definitely better for you. You'd be a fool not to negotiate a deal with them. Right? But he's not just talking about that. What he's saying, he's really talking about our debt before God. And he's saying, why are you not using the brevity of this life, which is like a mist, here one moment and gone the next? Why are you not using this life, which is like a, a short walk to court, 
to negotiate a deal with the God to whom you owe it all. Now, Jesus teaches us that because of our sinful nature, we will not spend eternity with God in heaven. And I know some of you are like, well, I don't like that. That doesn't sound fair to me. And I don't like a God who would do that. And I understand, I understand. But I think when it comes to believing in the God of the Bible, the question shouldn't be, do I like him or do I agree with him or is he fair or is he nice? I think the fundamental question beneath it all is, is he real, right? Because if he's real, your opinions don't trump the facts of the sovereign God of the universe. And all of a sudden, the question is no longer, do I like him? The question is, am I going to submit to his sovereign authority? I mean, he's the one who defines what justice is anyway. If he's real, if he created it all, he's the one who defines justice and defines goodness. He's the one who set the world upon the foundation uh, and put the stars in the sky as the angels rejoiced. We don't define what's good and evil. He does, right? We must negotiate freedom. Jesus, this is the good news of the Bible, offers himself as a payment. When we ask him, he will pay our debt. And instead of us going to debtor's prison, he actually goes on our behalf. God tells us he's the only way for us to spend eternity with God in heaven. And I feel like so many of us, we procrastinate thinking about this. You know, I mean, there's plenty of evidence behind it. And I will admit, there are parts of it that seem peculiar to me. But nevertheless, after looking at the compendium of evidence for all world faiths, from atheism to Buddhism to Christianity, I think there's no doubt that the narrative of the Bible and the God of the Bible is the one true hope for the world. I think so many of us, we kind of know that. We kind of know Jesus died for our sins. We kind of talk about that whole thing. Oh, I kind of believe in whatever. I'm not sure, but I'll figure it out when I get older. I'll worry about profession when I'm older. For so many of us, we kind of grew up around church. We grew up kind of believing in God. We grew up kind of saying prayers. I respect it because my parents do, but I'll think about it later. That's the classic. And I just want to speak to millennials from my generation for a moment. I want to speak to you guys. I love you guys. You're right. I'm, I'm part of you. I know exactly how it feels. I'll figure it out later. I will have fun now. I'll figure it out later. You know, whatever. I got time. You know, every time before I come out on the stage, I have one specific prayer. I say, God, if this is the very last message I get to preach before you call me home or before you return and rip open the heavens and reveal your glory to the world, may it be the right message for that moment. I just, I want to speak as though this is the last opportunity I'll ever have. I just think for a lot of us, we think I'll figure it out later, but your later is not guaranteed. Not only that, but if the narrative of the Bible is real, and God doesn't ask us for blind faith. He gives us informed faith. If the narrative of the Bible is real, we actually have an opportunity to store up treasure in heaven. I mean, God says, don't store up treasure on earth where uh, thieves break in and steal and moths destroy, but instead store up treasure in heaven where moths cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. And we have an opportunity to do that with this life. Why would we not? I want to challenge you to say today is the day. I'm not going to live on somebody else's coattails. I'm not going to borrow somebody else's faith. I think for many of us, the question, you know, who is Jesus to you? We can't really answer it. Well, I'm not sure. I'll figure it out when I have more time. I talked with someone the other day. She said, you know, I really kind of believe all this stuff, but the idea of going all in on it, I just, I'm not sure. I think I need a little bit more time. I said, how much time? How much time is enough? Because you will go the rest of your life saying, I just need a little bit. I mean, there is still faith involved in it, in any belief system. But I think at some point, we need to make a decision. I would challenge you to say, okay, I'm going to research this for X period of time, whatever that is, and then I'm going to jump in on it. We have a program at our church called Next Steps. And I love the Next Step program because we specifically pair you with a mentor who will help guide you through your spiritual journey. And I don't know what that is, but you do, and they will find out, and they will help you figure out this is what your next step should be. Right? Maybe it's making profession of faith. Maybe it's becoming an owner. Maybe um, it's joining a life group. Right? They'll help you work out what your God story is. They'll help you get a God story if you don't have one. But I think for so many of us, we come here and we sort of just languish. We sort of think, oh, that's a great message from Pastor. He gives me, he gives me some faith. What are you going to do about it? When is my faith going to become your faith? When are you going to embrace this for yourself? When are you going to stop riding on people's coattails and say, God, this is for me? And look, I don't care about membership. I don't care about ownership as a thing. I just think that as a generation, as a culture, as a society in America today, we we want to have every single opportunity open to us. We never want to, like, commit to something. And the problem with that is we never actually experience anything on a deep and real level. We never experience the joy of, of putting down roots in a place and doing life there. We never experience the joy of a lifelong relationship. We never experience the, the satisfaction that comes from a deep and rich community together. We never experience the, the deep satisfaction of a life built on a loving God, on faith in a loving God. And I just, I want us as a church to experience that and not miss out. And I want to challenge you as a person today to say, I am going to make a commitment. I am going to figure this out.
The application for, for many of you is simple. I just, I want you to take a next step. I want you to grab this card. I want you to fill it out and I want you to drop it off at the welcome desk and say, you know what? I'm done kicking the can down the road. Today, I'm going I'm to figure out who Jesus is to me. For others of you, you know, you're already owners here. You already know what you believe. And uh, I would just challenge you to take this home and to put it at a place in your life and say, I'm going to get serious about maximizing every moment. But I'd ask you to pray with me as we close. Um, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this church, for this community. I thank you for your hand on our lives. I thank you that you give us so much evidence for who you are, Lord. You don't ask for blind faith. You don't ask for stupid faith, Lord. You give us informed faith. But I just pray that as a church, we could act on the truth that you've shown us. I pray that we would not procrastinate in any area of our life, but especially regarding eternity, Lord. I pray that we would be a people who, who, who live not hypocritically, but live according to the truths that we say we believe. Thank you for your faith and your loving kindness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen and amen. I want to ask you guys to stand. The band's going to lead us in one more song.